Thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon uh, for our panel on uh, LGBT uh, characters and identities in high school musicals as part of uh, LGBT History Month. Uh, thank you to the University of Wolverhampton uh, for hosting us and for the marketing team for supporting us today. And a special thank you to uh, Marvin Charles and Preston Max Allen, who are joining us as part of the panel today. Uh, just a quick reminder that if you want to ask any questions during the session, there's a Q&A uh, button at the very bottom, and there's also a chat button. Uh, just to remind you that this would, is a, pl a public platform, so please don't put any personal information there unless you want to private message me your bank details. Um, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so I think to start off with, I'm just going to get um, Marvin and Preston to introduce themselves, say a little bit about the sorts of things they've been working on. And then we'll uh, open the floor for any questions that people might want to ask. Uh, so Marvin, do you want to start off? <laughs> cool. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marvin Charles. Um, I work in the performing arts industry. Um, I've been a performer for, gosh, uh, about 15 years now. Um, working professionally uh, in things like TV, musical theatre and around the world. Um, yeah, most recently I've been working musical theatre wise in the West End um, and productions like everybody's talking about Jamie um, and bring on the, the musical. And, yeah. <laughs> Thanks Marvin and uh, Preston. Hello, uh, my name is Preston and I am in Chicago right now. So it's very much my morning. So the evening, I keep reminding myself it's okay to be tired. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, mostly write musicals. I write a lot of musicals for teens um, and the show I had off Broadway in 2019 is called We Are the Tigers. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and right now I'm doing kind of a mix of musicals, uh, plays, film and television. And I do a lot of um, storytelling about trans characters and trans community stuff, um, certainly lately. So that has been what I am up to. And most importantly, I uh, am the father of a wonderful cat who may or may not make an appearance, but <laughs> I hope she does because she's the best. <laughs> we are definitely up for cat appearances. My cat currently is being lazy and is asleep, so I don't think we'll be having any appearances from Chester this afternoon. <laughs> um, so to start us off, I, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about um, some of the musicals that you've mentioned already. So things like um, Everybody's Talking About Jamie, uh, Bring It On, uh, We Are The Tigers, and perhaps to talk a little bit about um, why those, how you found taking part, well, in your case, writing the musical Preston, but, uh, you know, performing in the musical, being part of that community, and what, and in what way you think it might be an important thing for, uh, for I guess, for musical theatre to represent. Um, can I give that to you first, Marvin? Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be a part of the original cast of uh, Everybody Was Talking About Jamie. Um, and when I got the job, I hadn't really heard much about the show apart from it had only had two weeks prior uh, being in Sheffield. Um, but kind of as we were developing the show and everything, understanding the story about um, the 16 year old boy that wanted to go to his prom in a dress and kind of like how um, he was dealing with the situations with like buddies with his parents and things like that. Uh, I didn't realize how how strong and how touching the show would be. It was initially only meant to last for like two, three months in the West End and it ended up lasting gosh, four years with now a film and international tour, a European tour. So it just blew up. And I think it's because the story just resonates with a lot of people on so many different levels. Um, the character of Jamie, you can relate to him and his struggles no matter what your background is even if you haven't seen the show even like the characters like dean the bully you end up like resonating with why he could possibly be at, reacting that way and things but uh, the main message of the show was to kind of um, acceptance and just being able to be who you want to be and i think that's why it was so powerful and just hit home with so many people and just ended up being and resonating in the show that it has become today, which I think is incredible. I think it's so important 
that people get to see that. Um, because times are changing and th things are growing and developing and it's so nice to kind of be able to have that platform to see what so many people are possibly going through and to have such a strong character that like goes through those struggles but holds their own at the same time I think is just wonderful. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Marvin. Well, um, maybe we'll give you a bit of a break. We'll maybe talk a little bit about We Are The Tigers and then come back for Bring It On in a minute. But yeah, thank you for that. And we'll definitely pick up some of the things that you've mentioned there about Jamie as well. Uh, so, so Preston, tell us a little bit about uh, We Are The Tigers. Yeah, so when I like approach, like there's a lot of different ways of approaching queer storytelling and, and queer young people. And um, some of it is stories that very much are particularly about queerness and about, um, Usually I don't write about characters who are struggling with personal identity. Um, that's just not like, I, there's so many stories that are so beautiful about that. And usually I uh, focus on people who are kind of challenged by the outside world attacking their personal identity. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, that's a lot of what I do in my writing. And Tigers to me is so, it's, it's I'm so glad that people are connecting to the queerness of it because it's, it's one of those stories where um, in addition to very queer specific storytelling, I also just, will make sure that there are queer characters in everything I'm doing who are you know doing the same thing that everyone else is without queerness being a big deal. And in Tigers, um, that that's very much the case. It's just uh, a few of the cheerleaders are queer and, and, um, and in different shapes of identity, and it's not a super big deal. And uh, you know they have unrequited love stories, just like other characters who are straight in the show and um, and a little bit of relationship stuff. And mostly, mostly the musical is about murder. Um, so as far as like queerness and love goes, um, it is it is not the central uh, focus of that story. But the characters uh, are meant to be really authentic, uh, heart forward takes on archetypes that blend, you know, camp and um, authenticity. And so there is a lot of love that goes into those characters and goes into the experience of being a, a queer person in high school on a cheerleading team, uh, surrounded by cishet normativity, um, figuring yourself out. So, uh, you know, there is a, some queer specific, uh, I believe, like struggle there certainly to the character of Kate in terms of just trying to figure out how she fits in with this group of people. Um, as all of the cheerleaders are trying to figure out how they fit in with like the greater expectations put on them. Uh, so that's been, I've been really glad that people have connected to that character and to the others in the show. Um, and one thing that I've loved about working on that show is I've been writing it for a long time. Um, and initially when I started writing it in 2010, 2011, um, the characters were judgmental of, of her queerness, and that was something that she was called out for, and that the character of Cairo, um, who's the kind of, she's not the captain, but she's closer to the head cheerleader than the captain is, um, was, was kind of uh, aggressive about towards her was queerness. Um, and and Cairo is still the one who's a little, a little the, the most on top of calling that out, but um, the team is now very supportive overall and doesn't care and it's not a big deal. So that was a really cool thing for me to be able to look, you know, in 2010 and say, you know, realistically, I think as, as the writer of this, like this would be something that would be hard for this character uh, and that other characters may be judgmental about. To, and then to feel that realistically, I it was able to remove that from the story. And it did feel like this group of people could be really supportive and could really, uh, foster, foster this character and the, you know, the, I don't want to give anything away, but, uh, you know, even, even the trickiest characters in the show don't care about anyone's sexuality. <laughs> That's not a problem, um, in terms of, of why some people are, are targets. Um, so yeah, that was a really, I loved making that edit. And it also kind of inspired a lot of other stuff in terms of if I can give this character an experience where they're not attacked for their queerness, can I, like, I want to do that. Can I do that? And then if I can, like, absolutely, I, I just want, you know, that character to have as much uh, of a journey as everyone else has in the show to be dealing with the plot of the show and the relationships in the show and not just calling out, um, as we've seen so many times, you know, the queer character getting getting bullied. Um, and then when we do see that story, uh, 
I'm, I'm always very happy to, not happy to see, but to see it from queer writers who have really personal connections to that story. That's when I'm like, great, I'm gonna pass the mic on that to you um, to share your words and your experience. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's been the writing journey of Tigers, which if you're not familiar about, is about a cheer team that's really, really bad and two of them get murdered uh, during their annual sleepover where they're trying to like get back on their feet and be a better team. Uh, it does not go well and then they do not handle it well. And <laughs> that's the course of the show. Thank you. It's it's such a it's such a fun show. I mean, obviously, we shouldn't be saying murder is fun, but it is <laughs> in this particular context. And it, I, one of the things I find quite interesting, I mean, bring it on, and we are the tigers. They're not particular sim particularly similar, other than the fact that they both involve cheerleading groups. Um, but actually, there is that thing about. Um, queerness and how queerness is treated and I think this is true of Jamie as well how queerness is treated by the other students there as well so Marvin you've just finished uh, on a, a, a um, production of Bring It On uh, a very lovely production of Bring It On which I really enjoyed um, uh, but I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, how, about your experiences with Bring It On I suppose from whatever perspective you you want to really yeah well um I was a massive fan of the original film, like I had it on VHS um, and watched it a ridiculous amount of time. So when I got the job, obviously, I was very, very excited about it. Um, and it's a mix between like the first film and the third film, but still its own take. Um, so my character wasn't um, queer identifying, but the beauty of it was the the ensemble cast members were able to just be a character they wanted to be they didn't have to hide anything they didn't have to be uh like hetero identifying or anything like that they were they were given the free reign to be however they wanted which i thought was fantastic because you don't get to see that very much in musicals it's very much the ensemble have to be like a certain type of way but fabian really allowed everyone to just kind of um, unless it was a specific character like mine, Twig, who had a love interest, Bridget. Um, otherwise, you just kind of had freedom to just do you, which was lovely. Um, but still, even then, like it didn't, the show doesn't touch, um, doesn't hone in or touch on any queerness or anything like that. So it's all just about like the fun and the development of the show it's more about kind of understanding relationships within friends and how that that's like a family vibe and trust and those sorts of things um yeah that, yeah it was great i loved it <laughs> um i'm trying to think I, mean, I think one of the things i mean there's a couple of things with with that i mean i i did actually notice that there were some because I, it's one of the things I always look for in musicals as being somebody yeah. who's been and seen so many musicals with LGBT characters before. It really bothers me when I see so many musicals where the ensemble are all perceived as heterosexual, whether that's yeah. because of the way that they are, they are put into boy-girl pairings or whatever it is. And actually having a musical where that could be something that's explored, I thought was wonderful. And, yeah. and the other thing with Bring It On as well, of course, is that there's a, there's a trans character written in as um, La, La Cienega. Is that how you say it? La Cienega. That was nowhere near. La, C <laughs> La Cienega. Should have checked that before I started. Yeah, La C Cienega. And, and that, that is, um, that's a role which is, I guess, again, it, it's hardly remarked on at all. No, and that's that's the, that's what um, especially Jal, um, who was playing the character in our show, mm. they wanted to emphasise and things that that um, their transness wasn't the be all and end all of that story. They were able to just portray their character that they wanted to be. I think it only gets touched upon once in the show, mm. where um, Bridget's having a moment after I've had an interaction with her. And she's talking about how hard it is for her. And Jal's like, are you serious? Mm. That is actually the only moment in the show where her transness is touched upon. Mm. Otherwise, she, uh, she's just playing a, uh, like her character, which is great because mm. why should it have to be the forefront of uh, like her character as a person as a show? Like, the, the, it, it, 
not that it doesn't matter, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be the forefront. I, I, I'm trying to think of another word, but my brain just isn't working. No, I think we, I think we get what you're saying there. I think yeah. it is, you know, it's that just in every other character is like Amber Davis's character. Mm. She ends up um, with one of the guys, but that's not touched upon. So why should the trans character have to be highlighted that this mm. is the trans part? Like it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. And I hope that's that is paving away and pushing into the direction that we're going, that it shouldn't, mm. the freedom for parts should be parts. It shouldn't have to be, this is a heterosexual part, this is a queer, like it should be able to be, we can play roles because we're right for the roles. Mm. And it is, and having that sort of agency over particularly characters that are ensemble, but actually I bring this up so often in nearly all of these talks now, but I spoke to an actor um, about playing the role of, uh, which was it? It was one of the roles in Guys and Dolls and he is a he is a gay actor and he said to me um well i always play that character as gay because there's nothing to say that he has to be straight is there and if i give him yeah. if i make that character gay and he has you know he's attracted to nathan detroit or he's a you know he's attracted to sky or whatever it might be it yeah. gives a different motivation for that character and i think that's one of the things with something like bring it on particularly that's that's really important is to allow those sort of things to happen in the background, even when it's not a musical necessarily about sexuality. Yeah, um, definitely. Because I feel like I did that um, in Jamie. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, the the um, the year eleven were technically all meant to be heterosexual, but mm -hmm. as I was speaking on the show, there was one of the characters who I definitely thought wasn't heterosexual, was possibly kind of figuring things out. So I liked to play it in that way again it's not it's not touched upon but i like to play it in that kind of like oh maybe he's questioning that's that sort of realm um because why why should we not why should i not <laughs> you know yeah absolutely and i think it's one of the things and one of the reasons i wanted to talk particularly about high school musicals is that there are there are a few musicals which are about LGBT. Well, it tend, I was saying LGBTQ characters, but it tends to be uh, lesbian or gay characters. Whether it is that character and they are the only um, queer character in the musical, so everybody's talking about Jamie, um, uh, the prom, um, uh, the uh, the louder we get, or prom queen as it used to be known. There's those sort of musicals there, but then most other musicals, most other high school musicals, don't really touch on sexuality or gender that much in fact they ignore it and I'm, I'm interested um I think I'm interested with We Are The Tigers as well Preston I'm interested in in how you kind of went about um I guess working out the mix of characters that you wanted to to have in that because it's all in quite a closed location it all takes place in, a, in the house doesn't it during a sleepover and I'm really interested in how you kind of chose who was going to be part of that mix uh -huh. Well, for Tigers, I it's, it was actually fairly easy. Um, for some shows, it's less because Tigers, they're all supposed to be um, modeled after horror archetypes. Um, so you have, you know, the like, <laughs> the virgin character and, you know, the, the slut character. You're supposed to truly have those archetypes. And then the, uh, the whole point of Tigers is the, to then deconstruct what's behind, you know, the fun drunk character. You know, we're so used to that, like, fun drunk or like you know a character who is you're supposed to be okay with dying because they were promiscuous and being like well like these are what these are actual people like in in a piece in a work um and a lot of horror takes that you know it's they're not actual people you're watching a horror piece you're watching a performance but in a lot of especially teen work um, you do want to see the story you're watching as real people as like a real story as meaningful and yeah, especially when it's young people, uh, especially when it's queer people. So, you know, for some of those horror works, I don't quite, I don't question the archetype. I understand that they're just playing with tools. And then for me, the whole point, especially with the music was to deconstruct. How did we get here? How did we get to this one word that defines, especially a young woman, especially in horror that we all accept. And then often 
kind of like watch that character get brutally murdered <laughs> and sometimes they're like ah wasn't that brutal <laughs> and then in some cases you're supposed to go serves them right <laughs> and so when you like take those components and you're like oh that's actually a little like messed up they're sometimes to a large degree messed up in certain things um yeah you want to tear them apart and deconstruct them and so the book of tigers uh, certainly for the first 25 pages is meant to set up that kind of horror structure and to be familiar with like the very type A control freak. And I, I use labels that I would never use, use like to describe real people. Um, but you set up those things and, and then you knock them all down throughout. So the first 25 minutes are that um, kind of structure of setting up, you know, what is normal for these characters. People go, oh, I'm familiar with this group of people. You know, I'm excited to see what happens you know in the horror as it all unravels and then the point is um when you add music you really get to kind of zoom out of the bickering and the miscommunication and the comedy and really say well, what is like what is the inner monologue of these characters what defines these characters what breaks them apart um and then yeah and then how do they sometimes for coping reasons or for safety like reasons become an archetype to fit in with a group so that, yeah, that was a lot of um, of why those people end up together. They're really all pulled, you know, the, I would say the wallflower character, but there's a song called Wallflower and that's the, Riley is not the one who I would, I would say matches that archetype in the show. Um, you know, how, yeah, how do they get there? And then what what is like the very full meaningful world behind that? And then how at the end of the show, do you look at people who you looked at very um, reductively at the beginning and go, oh, wow, I was wrong and that was reductive. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I think that there's there's that whole thing. And then for the characters who um, die uh, pretty early on, what I have found is, you know, you don't get the experience to go, oh, now I know them better and that was reductive. But a lot of uh, the, the feedback that I've heard certainly is people who are really sad that you don't get to know those characters more um, and that they were judged really harshly uh, for certain tiny parts of their personality when obviously there was so much more going on and there was so much more to know and we didn't get to. Um, and I know that's frustrating for some people who wish they got to know those characters better, but it's also to me like a success of the show that there was such a belief in them um, when horror, you usually don't go, wow, I really like wish, I really wish that girl, you know, that girl had stuck around more. They're built to be disposable. Um, so yeah, that, that's how they all ended up in a room together. Um, and I, I continue to spend time in different adaptation lands trying to continue to build on them and continue to uh you know minimize and then massively expand so it's all it's all always happening <laughs> that's that's so interesting because as you're talking about that i'm thinking about the characters and bring it on as well and how actually that's very similar to what happens to at least some of the the lead characters in bring it on um and um yeah um we're starting to get some questions into the q a box do feel free to to drop questions in there and we'll we'll get to them uh, as we go through today. Um, I just wanted to ask one other thing, which is um, I'm thinking about musicals. I'm, I'm a bit older than both of you, I think. Well, I think I'm quite a bit older than both of you, but I'm thinking about the musicals that I, the high school musicals that I would have watched growing up. So for me, I guess it would have been things like Grease and um, I'm trying to think what else there would have been, but the, certainly when I was watching Grease, there wouldn't have been any characters there that I would have gone, oh, there I am, there's me. And I'm wondering whether there are any, whether you've found any kind of characters within any high school musicals that you find that you can relate to in that way. I can speak on this a little kind of initially because I, I get asked this question in terms of like in trans conversations a lot is who did you relate to and as a trans guy. <laughs> No, no one out there who's got my identity, uh, certainly in musicals before 2019. Uh, and even then it's very complicated. Um, it's funny because for me, I really identified with like male characters who are really lost in life. And I think there can be a lot of experience of queerness that is related to that. And I'm speaking very specifically about Pippin and Moritz. Uh, so Pippin from Pippin and Moritz from Spring Awakening are characters who are very confused by sexuality and very confused by identity and very troubled <laughs> and like don't have tools and don't have community. So as someone who had no I, understanding of really even my own trans identity at that point, that was those were characters who I really, really gravitated towards um, as a kid. 
Um, and then a little bit like Natalie from Next Normal in terms of just that frustration <laughs> of like not, of having a plan and not being sure it's gonna work and, and feeling that feeling of unraveling. So I <laughs> sound like I had such a sound, I had a fine child, but I was largely okay. <laughs> but um, those characters were, yeah, were, were how I perceived a lot of queerness, even though having things like Xana Don't and Alter Boys like available in terms of, and I'm sure there were other, you know, musicals, Spring Awakening at an early age, uh, your cat beat mine. Um, <laughs> and uh, like those were available, but they were all also um, super large scale, like super campy, um, super big. And also uh, at that time I identified as a lesbian. So there was not a lot of lesbian, Maureen and Rent was really holding down uh, the fort for, that energy. Um, but it's so funny you mentioned Greece because that is one of, there's two musicals that I feel like I would love to adapt from a queer lens that lend themselves to queerness. Like it wouldn't, I think, be forcing anything. And I would love to explore like the stone butch femme culture of that era through Greece and have Danny uh, be a queer person, uh, be um, in, in the stone butch world. And that can mean a lot of things, you know, and there's a lot of different and interesting ways to explore how transness existed within that culture too. If that was an angle, that would be an angle. Um, you know, uh, butch lesbianism would be an angle. There's a lot of really cool stuff, um, I think that could happen with that specific piece. So I hope that Greece can come back and, and, and do another uh, generation of, of storytelling from that lens. <laughs> That's such an amazing idea. Now, I'm not going to be able to watch Greece now without seeing um, Danny as a, as a butch lesbian character. <laughs> I think that's an amazing idea. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's one of the things, actually, when we're talking about, I mean, I'm talking about there being very little gay um, representation, but of course, even up until recently, there was no lesbian, trans, uh, bisexual, um, any other sort of queer representation in, in these musicals at all, unless you really look deep for them and, and you try and find them. Um, the other thing I've noticed about um, high school musicals is they tend to be very, very white in terms of the characters. And actually, I was thinking about this when I was watching Bring It On, and I feel like Bring It On might be the only high school musical where there are um, characters which are specifically written for different ethnicities, but um, and it's but it's not what really what the story is. I mean, it's part of what the story is, but it's not like Hairspray, uh, where the story is exactly that. Um, so yeah, yeah so no, kind of um, the the film that it's based on was very it it was very about white and black, so very kind of the same sort of same level as Tears Favor, obviously not that far back. Um, but the the story still does push on that narrative uh, on this white girl coming into like the kind of poorer black community. Mm. I think it really just tries to push more on the kind of the different circumstances. Like every time we'd have conversations, like especially Vanessa who played um, Danielle, she really didn't want to play it as like the angry black girl that kind of like has no up, like has had no help with her upbringing or anything like that. She wanted to play it on the fact that they just have different circumstances, different values of how they have to kind of get themselves out of these situations and things like that. And it was it was so lovely to can be a part of that and be an authentically like black or like myself a mixed race character that I could just play it as that and not have to be any more or any less like when you like when you were talking about the um character like high school characters the only like the first thing that came into my head was Hairspray because that was pretty much the only musical like show that I resonated with when I was growing up was because I was like oh like seaweed and you know, he's still got kind of like a a chill, cool environment that he, that he obviously knows is black and white going on around him, but he's just so kind of calm and chilled with it, which is how I feel like I grew up being a mixed race person, like mm -hmm. coming to the um, like musicals and things. Um, so yeah, no, it was very much great. Like I did, although the show, again, the script has a lot of like, oh, okay, look at this white girl and things like that. Mm -hmm a lot of us didn't want that to be screamed at you in a sense. <laughs> um, like, especially like, because my character goes after 
um, Bridget, who's a white girl. She happens to be a bigger girl, and like, but he again, he doesn't. He like he doesn't care about any of those sorts of things. She's just she's just a person that he's attracted to, um, which again I thought was really nice that like those things were becoming like acceptable, which it should be because there's so many different types of people out there. Like, um, yeah, I don't know. I think the, like the only one of the only musicals that really resonated with me uh, with queerness was Bear. The musical. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that when I met my um, one of my first partners. We ended up going on a date there by accident. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, like because like, oh, a, a friend invited him, so I was like, oh, okay, hi. Um, but yeah, that was I remember watching that and being like, oh, wow, like a queer, like a queer story is told, and especially in that kind of environment as well that this, the story's set, and you're like, oh, okay, cool, like nice um where are these <laughs> you know so especially as a like a queer black man you don't really like you don't really see much of that happening either so i think there's there's still so many like stepping stones to kind of go but it is good that they're starting to push more and more and start to be a lot more open which it should be <laughs> i mean i thought that was one of the things that your production did so well is that it felt like that you some of the like the edges of the original had been I don't want to say like it's smoothed off to make it sound like yeah. it's been dumbed down but it's been, there was something about it that made it that it made it right for mm. for 2022 <clears throat> I don't yeah. think what year is it 2022 rather <laughs> than the original you know I guess the original must be about 50 I can't feel like it's 2000 is it 2000 I can't remember I'll be lying if I made yeah. that but yeah um, that's exactly what guided the director um, and Fabian, they had a conversation with Universal about that they wanted to change up the script and make it current and not so ha how it was back then. Mm. Like they wanted to update it so it was current to our current situations and the year that we're in and how mm. things are changing and developing and growing. And that's what they needed and I think it worked. I think that's one of the things and it, it kind of strikes me about what Preston was talking about with Greece as well is that I suppose one of the things we've often been reluctant or been unable to do is to update and really reimagine shows as we go through because the version of Greece as far as I mean it's been through some changes but Greece is pretty much now if you watch it now it's certainly pretty similar to the Greece that I saw in 1993 when I was 14 or whatever it was because the script has stayed the same. I mean, this is the first production of Greece that we've just announced in the UK. It's the first one that I remember where there's been um, black or mixed race um, actors playing roles like Rizzo or Roger or whatever it might be. Um, and so, it's, you know, this idea of musicals being things that can keep, I mean, that's one of the things with Jamie as well, is that Jamie was constantly being rewritten, not in a big way, but being slightly altered during the pandemic and that sort of thing as well. I wonder, Preston, when you're going back to work, is that something that you, if you're, if there's a new production happening, are you tempted to go back and sort of fiddle with the idea and, and kind of update it? You know, I, I think this is a question a lot of writers are asking. For me, not in terms of like the pandemic. Mm. Um, and Tigers is lucky in that they are, it's, it's one room in one night. So like yeah. I, I don't like I could in my mind be like they're all vaccinated so masks off when they, when they <laughs> enter and it takes place now um yeah so right yeah I I will update in terms of my evolution on hmm. how I want to be um exploring queerness and what I want to be doing in terms of character you know there's been um some I think very this is you know this is tricky this is personal but some valid interpretation of a character as um could in the future identify as non-binary um, and mm. doesn't in the in the script currently and doesn't right now, um, but I think certainly could. And so like, is there a version of the script where, um, you know, the pronouns uh, are gonna be they, them in, the, in certainly the stage directions for that character and that actor um, and things like that. And, and like, yeah, in a technical way, I think that it would be really great to have vocal lines um, that would be, um, effective for a possibility for all the roles for uh, people who don't have the um, 
with the range of some of the, the, the music demands. So I would really like for people to be able to play those characters without being beholden to the ranges that are currently written. Um, so that's kind of, that's what's more on my mind about changing and evolving there. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about how I can communicate that in a way. But I think a lot of, like we've had a lot of, um, we've had a lot, we've had three, uh, virtual uh, productions that have happened with with young people. And um, there's been um, non-binary performers in them and there's been, you know, different characters who have been non-binary and trans. And I'm so very excited about that. And I want to facilitate that. And it is a team where, yeah, it's like, A, I think it would never have to be addressed and B, it's a team where it's not a big deal. So it can be authentic and it can be, I think the actors can feel like they're uh, you know, working with their authentic identity as their character or not in this show. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited about that. And I think that's something I'm excited about in future productions and really want to help in terms of the like technical side of sheet music and range and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that is it. But in terms, yeah, I'm not, no, none of my things are dealing with like pandemic stuff right now. I think, I think that was just because the Jamie happened to be on stage at that exact time set in a school and it was, it, I guess, in some ways, it, it may, I, in some ways, it felt more. It was nice to have that sort of thing joked about in the pandemic when it was so difficult. I'm not saying that you know we should therefore any musical that's put on in the pandemic, Pretty Woman, put all those masks on. <laughs> I think, but I think, yeah, absolutely. I, I think I was thinking perhaps more in terms of what you were talking about there, in terms of vocal ranges and identities and and mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. Um, I'm going to turn to, I've got a couple of questions in the uh, chat. Uh, so this is from Nate, who says, I'm currently writing a musical which is set in an 80s high school that has multiple queer characters. What advice would you both give in terms of crafting the characters and making their storylines authentic? And also, is there something to be said about leaving the identities left to interpretation? The two main protagonists, oh, this is a long question. The two main protagonists of the two central couples both openly identify, but other characters don't. So I'm not sure how to navigate that in terms of writing and performance. I think there's about three questions in there. We'll start with, what, with the first one, which is, um, what advice would you give in terms of crafting characters that are queer characters and making their storylines authentic? I, uh, yeah, I think I was gonna try like, I think they might answer a few in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. um, there's like two different versions of world building, which is like, well, there's many, but in this case, you know, you are working with the time and the the views that were there at the time. And um, that can come into play as little or as much as you want to deal with it. Like if that's not the focus of your piece, um, then A, you just don't have to deal with it. And B, I think you can validate that you have crafted if, if this is what you can do with your piece, a group of people who just don't care and where it's just not a big deal and that's just the community. Um, so yeah, it's either kind of, it's a little bit either in rejection of the time um, and just saying, I, that's not what I wanna do, that's not what I wanna deal with, or um, or saying I've, I've validly created an authentic environment for these people where it doesn't have to be a big deal and anyone can identify however, and it's never really brought up. Um, or if it's important for the piece, you know, like the prom, then yeah, then that is trying to be within, um, yeah, within the, the world. So that's, that is how I kind of always see it. I say, am I, how much is the world coming into play? Because when the world comes into play, realistically, especially like with, with trans stories, it's hard, like it's difficult. The world is not easy on trans people. <laughs> and so when I'm trying to really take that into account, unless I create a community where it doesn't have to be a big deal, um, that often is like what the plot of my story is, is it's characters who are up against a lot. Um, but yeah, but it's very, it's very comforting and, and easy and uh, doable to be like, I've made this loving group of people and this is the space we're in right now, no matter what era. I think that's I think that's really lovely and important as well. Absolutely, Marvin. When you're approaching characters, I guess uh, as an actor, what sort of things do you like to find in the writing to um, to kind of guide that characterization? I mean, think particularly perhaps if you were looking at a queer character. Um, I think it's I think you uh, as you're developing a character, you always kind of have to define something that you can relate to within the material. Because although you're playing a character, that some some part of it has to come from you, so, so you have to connect to it in some sort of way. Um, so I think it's fine. It's finding that 
journey within the material from the start to the end of the text to work out kind of what journey that character might be on. So I think, yeah, kind of like with that, I, I agree with like what Preston uh, said that dep depending on the era, like if you're doing it in the 80s, then if it's not fundamental to the story for it to necessarily be like that, then you should be, yeah, you can be open to kind of it being to interpretation because it's not like queer people weren't about in those times. It was obviously just a very different time and it wasn't as acceptable and as open as it is now. So I think unless it's fundamental to the story, if you're, if you're allowing your actors of choice to kind of interpretate those characters however they want I think that kind of that really gives the story its own you know and it will make it unique because then every actor that plays those characters in no matter um, how many different times this play is shown or whatever everyone's going to interpret it differently which I think is great as well. I think that's what I mean one of the loveliest things as well about some of the musicals we're talking about here um, I mean, particularly as Marvin knows, I have seen Jamie a few times um, and I've probably seen Marvin play most because Marvin, we were swing on it. I think I've probably seen most you play most of those characters at least once. And it's I always fascinate. I remember asking you when I first did an interview, it always fascinates me about how you play. Uh, one like the character of Mickey very differently to the character of Saeed to the character of um, C.Y. Or, what, or whatever it might be and yeah. I think that that's the more room you can leave for that in some ways the better yeah because that that as I said that was the beauty of um, our director he he allowed us to kind of develop the characters in the way that we wanted to and as a swing as well like having four main different characters they have to look at and then possibly four others you can interpret their text and their lines in however you want so i did take i took the time to be like okay with this character what kind of would be their backstory and their journey into into this story going forward and things like that so it's 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 fun it's like if you if you're able to interpret material in whichever way you want it makes it so much more interesting as an actor like to develop these characters in such different ways and uh yeah it just makes them i can't think of where <laughs> but but yeah. it's definitely one of the joys of i mean being somebody like me that gets a little bit sometimes I say I'm doing it for research, but probably I saw Jamie more times than was strictly necessary for to be able to write a, you know, a bit of book about it. But yeah. one of the joys of it was seeing you, Marvin, when you took over just for a few weeks towards the end, you took over the role of Mickey and how that role became different in the way that you played it to the way that other actors had played it before as well. And it's yeah. quite a niche thing, but it's mm -hmm. but actually what I think one of the things it says is that you have to leave room with some of these you want to define certain things about the characters but you mm. also want to leave room for the actors to play and actually mm. maybe that answers partly the question about leaving some of the identities open to identity uh, to interpretation because then you does give you room if you've got um, an interesting you know people who are interesting doing the casting you can put you can make their roles that can be played by trans people or mm. roles that can be played by non-binary people or whatever it is and and yeah leaving some of that open or at least being willing to change things so that you can adapt them as they go through yeah um so i kind of hope that answers that question um the other question is what is what is it about the idea of horror and high school settings that draws people in queer people into the narratives as both a non-binary music theater musical theater researcher and a massive horror fan this connection has always stuck with me and made me wonder why that might be a question for you, Preston. <laughs> but you, also you, Marvin, I don't know. <laughs> a friend of mine is doing a documentary on queer horror and about how horror connects to queerness. So I'm like, oh my God, I, I don't wanna let Sam take the mic on that. And I would say like, look out for that documentary. I think uh, um, it should be premiering this year uh, at some point, this summer maybe. Um, but that is it, Sam Weinman is who's doing that. I think for me, um, I'm gonna speak through the lens of like Carrie and I think that Carrie, goes off into other things um is like Carrie is a character who is othered and looked at differently and can't connect with 
um, her peers in the way that everyone else does. And, you know, that it can be an experience of queer. Like I grew up in Texas and I was very lucky in my experience, but there that's definitely, um, you know, especially when there's no representation. So the representation of the person who's getting othered and looked at there is um, often, I think that's why there's a lot of queerness in horror is that's how it ex people or artists will explore that lens. And also, you know, uh, you know, when, when real life is is more horrifying than horror, it's a, it's a it can be kind of even a fun way to uh, explore that, to pull out the extremes, to really really examine things um, from that like larger than life angle. I think uh, can be very exciting. Yeah, so I think that um, you know it it both sucks that like that's how I think so much connection happens in media um in terms of queerness and uh it, it has been very problematic too but also it really depends who's behind the storytelling I think in a lot of ways how how that works out um but also it has created a lot of really incredible culty exciting horror and I watched Rocky Horror recently um for the first time in my adulthood I went a bunch as a teenager and I never really paid attention I was like throwing shit at the screen um and I watched it and I was like, wow, this could be like my take on this now might be like really like it could be seen as very problematic. I could see this coming out and people being like, what is this? This is not helping <laughs> representation. But also I can see it being a celebration of the other, of the bold, of the different. Um, and I, I've always seen it that way. So I think it's good that I got into it as a kid and I got into it as a queer kid in, in Texas looking for community because, yeah, it is such a wild it embraces sexuality it's not scared of it you know that's something that's so often thrown at queer people um as abuse is is how sexuality is discussed and handled and this is just it's so full it's so big in what it is it's so it's so unafraid in you know in being rocky horror that um that i i think that's partially yeah like a big part of the magneticism and the draw to the genre but look out for uh for that documentary there's a lot of really cool uh discussions on this it's, I mean, Rocky Horror is one of those musicals that I always think of Don't Dream It Be It and that whole scene, that kind of orgy scene that you have at that moment. And it's so liberating. At the same time, as you might think, OK, there's some there might be some problems here. People think this is the only way that queer people might <laughs> behave. But I don't think many people do think that. And at the end of Rocky Horror, you almost think you're almost a bit disappointed with the ending. You know, I won't give the ending away just in case anyone hasn't watched it. But, you know, sometimes you, you're like, no, I would just want this to carry on. I want this to be. I want this to be allowed, if that makes sense. I want this this and to be celebrated, like you say. That's really interesting. Thanks for that, Preston. Um, Marvin, are you a fan of horror? <laughs> I love it. I mean, I definitely watch horror like this, but <laughs> I still love it. I think it's just, yeah, I think, again, I agree. There's something about the kind of, um, like, associating the, with the outcast and things like that and ju just having like the depth to it rather than obviously just the killing and stuff like that but um yeah I think it's you're, you're just able you're just able to get lost in that and just take away the everything that's going on in the real world and just connect to those characters um, and I think it's the same with like the, the high school things so like no matter what school you went to there was always this kind of like labels for different people and like the different groups and different types of people and things like that, that everyone kind of would have connected to. So I think that's why high school things just do so well and make, make it uh, easy for shows to kind of just relate to. Um, they even play like, instance for like Mean Girls coming over when that comes over, like again, one of the, favorite films but you connect to that because there there's all these different sections that you possibly went through in high school but it's seeing that journey in a different light and how you kind of come out on the other side and have grown and, and, and become such a stronger person and it's always it's always almost like reflecting like reflecting on a journey and now looking at being able to look at yourself and be like oh, okay like I, I went through all that but now I'm this person and I'm like strong and I'm confident and I'm found my own and um and reflection is good isn't it that's what like that's what makes us stronger as as humans <laughs> 
as well. Yeah. That's a really interesting point, I think, Marvin, the idea, because obviously when you're right, most people who write musicals about high school tend mm. to be older than high school age. There's not yeah. many. I mean, there are musicals. I'm sure that high school uh, kids have written themselves, but actually the musicals that we watch are always told from that side. They're always told looking back. Um, yeah. Same as, I guess, stories about um, queer children as well. You mm. know, it's always told from an adult perspective looking back. And I think that's a, that's a really interesting way to think about it as well, because it's not just these high school musicals are for um, queer high school kids, although I hope that they do see themselves in some of these musicals. I think it's also about us as adults, maybe, in, I mean, certainly from my point of view, uh, as somebody that grew up during Section 28 in the UK, which was the, uh, the law about uh, uh, teachers not being able to promote homosexuality, whatever that meant. I mean, would they have it written on a scarf or something? I'm not sure what they thought promoting was, but certainly it was never talked about when I was at school. And so there's definitely something missing there. And I think that's one of the reasons perhaps why, oh, I'm psychoanalyzing myself here. But one of the reasons why I loved Jamie so much is because that, that moment where all of the classmates get behind Jamie and stand up for him, I wanted that moment. I needed that moment. And now as an adult, that's you know that's something that happens through the stories that we tell and yeah. and 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 yeah that was that was definitely one of the most powerful things as well that with jamie is the fact that you know that that's a real story mm. you know that that actually happened for someone that they that these these kids in his school were like on a wave with him through the fence and then like at the end of it actually ended up supporting him and having his back and like rallying with him which goes oh my god so then people connected to it because for like the the um the older generation that wouldn't have had may not have or wouldn't have had that are able to go oh my god like look how far we've come look how far we've grown like that's amazing and it's still continuing to grow so i think that's why it's so beautiful Thanks, Marvin. Yeah, it's, oh, I'm a little bit like, oh, I've come to a bit of an epiphany about myself there. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> um, I was just going to finish off with just one, one last question. And I was, I asked this question quite often in these sort of panels, but I'm interested to think about what sort of work you would like to see or what sort, of, what sort of stories you would like to see more of, not necessarily just in the high school genre, but what sort of things would you like to see uh, musicals written about? Perhaps. <laughs> Big question. I can, I can talk about that. I want to see musicals written about any anything to a degree by queer and race, and specifically also trans creators. Like I want to see genre stories through trans and queer lenses that have nothing to explicitly do with transness, but like is influenced by experience. You know, and then I wanna see stories of queerness told by queer creators. Um, those are certainly out there um, in mass and they're extraordinary. And the, you know, there is such a reluctance uh, by commercial forces that be often, uh, and sometimes not, but often to, to put those at the forefront because of um, connection with audiences that may uh, try to reject those stories. So I want to see, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, in America <laughs> presently, uh, we have, we just got a big problem with authentic queer storytelling very much on Broadway um, and authentic queer storytelling for young people. And I can think of um, stories where there's been much more scandal about how queerness has been handled or where it's a joke um, for high schoolers than, um, or fantasy to some degree, uh, than authentic storytelling. And and, uh, and so I would love to, yes, yeah, stop seeing um, or, or see a little less of the fantasy and stop seeing the joke um, and see authenticity and meaning. And that doesn't mean drama and that doesn't mean intensity. Uh, it can, but yeah, it's, it means a bunch of things and I, it's, it's, uh, it's out there. It's, it just takes us uh, stripping away the, the fear of the, uh, of the kind of Midwestern conservatism is how I often kind of, uh, see that, but it's, it's definitely part of a larger problem, just kind of mirrored uh, on stage. Thanks. Thanks Preston for that. What about you, Marvin? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. I'd love to see like some queer ethnic stories because I don't, I, especially in the black community, I don't feel like that. Well, actually not just especially in many, many communities, but eth in ethnic 
communities <laughs> um, I don't feel like there's that, that likes to be touched upon at all because it's very it's very hard to deal with for a lot of like older generations of the family so it'd be lovely for authentic stories like that to be pushed as well and not just be about all the pain and all the suffering and everything just to have like beautiful stories just to be told and again as Preston said not it not to just all be like about the jokes or the laughs at them it'd be instead it'd be with them um I think that would be great absolutely great <laughs> thank you and I think if there's one thing I've learned as as most people who uh, who are here probably will know I'm currently writing a book called LGBTQ characters and queer representation in contemporary musical theatre and actually the reason I know both Preston and Marvin is because I've interviewed them for that book but the one thing that I think I've learned most is that um, it, it's important to support not just to support you will get far more than you realize for going to watch stories that you don't think necessarily are just about you the amount that I've learned from talking to people like Preston about trans stories and watching, uh, you know, all sorts of different stories that are not necessarily on Broadway or on the West End, but are out there in the little fringe venues. And the amount that I've learned from talking to people like Marvin and, and you know, watching stories that are specifically written by the Black community for the Black community or by the Asian community for the Asian community. It's not the case that those stories are not for, are not for you, if that makes sense. It's really important that we, as a queer community, that we support as much storytelling as we can, whether or not we see ourselves completely there within it. I think that's really important. And the other thing that I would just kind of signpost people towards, I've started this um, this website called, I've got to try, I think it's called queermusicals.com. I can't remember the name of my own website. I will, I will check that for you. But um, that has got links to loads and loads. Yeah, it's queermusicals.com. That's got links to loads and loads of musicals. And I've tried to categorise them a little bit as well, start to categorise them so that you can hear things from musicals like The Regulars, uh, which was on a Manchester Hope Mill Theatre just a couple of weeks ago as a concert version. Uh, things like Paper or Plastic, which is a high school story, but has got a trans character right in the center of it um, you know there's all sorts of things like um, leave to remain which was a story that was written very specifically about an interracial queer relationship um, and there's little bits that you can listen to and you can just get to know them a bit and maybe even get in touch with the people that have written them or that have been part of them to find out more because I think the more that we can support these stories the more chances that we have for to have all of these wonderful stories that haven't been told yet and to hear them and to and to love them, which is that to me is the most important thing about musicals. Um, but thank you so much, um, everyone, for, for joining us today. And particularly thank you so much to Preston and to Marvin uh, for, for um, taking part in that and for all of the wonderful, wise things that you've shared with us. Um, is there anything that, uh, anything that people want to, anything you want to add at the end or uh, anything, anything you're working on at the moment or anything like that at all? Or? Uh, you, you can go ahead if you wish. <laughs> um, no, not really. <laughs> Working on myself. <laughs> I've, done the, <laughs> I've done the awkward ending, haven't I? Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I um, I was going to say, I'm not like doing anything in particular right now that is available. Hopefully some of the stuff that I'm working on will be public at some point. But I was thinking, you know, of musicals that are happening that... um that like people can look forward to is I'm thinking a lot about Strange Loop, which I'm so excited to see. I'm so excited it's coming to Broadway. Um, it's, you know, it's definitely, I'm excited to see how it interacts with audiences that it's going to, um, to uh, challenge. And that's Michael R. Jackson. And it is um, about a queer black man and uh, basically just his experience at, in theater, working in theater, uh, uh, in the world on dating and sex. It's just very, very brilliantly written um, and it's coming to Broadway. So that is gonna be out there and I think everyone should support that um, as much as possible. And then Interstate, um, which I'm not quite sure where Interstate is playing, but it's happening soon. There's a production of it coming up. Uh, that's Los Angeles, I think. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I know it's like it's a big production and that's uh, 
uh, Kit Yan and Melissa Lee, who's an incredible team, and Kit Yan is a, is a trans writer, and it's about um, Asian American trans experience in a punk band. So those are very uh, exciting shows. So it's it's all it's not all uh, grim. <laughs> um, there's a lot of grim. I'm sure I'm, I'm missing tons of them, but those two are on my mind uh, to follow right now. And the regulars, of course, which I'm so happy yeah. with over there, and I can't wait to see it uh, here. <laughs> and, and that's a brilliant link, actually, because next week's panel at this time, four o'clock next. Uh, Friday. Actually, we've got Melissa Lee, who's writing Interstate, coming to talk to us about queer Asian representation uh, in musical theatre. We've also got Matthew Kuhn, uh, who is a ballet dancer and has uh, started writing um, uh, work and also uh, was in Billy Elliot when that first came to the West End. And hopefully uh, we have uh, another panellist as well, uh, which I will uh, put out onto the social media next week. But uh, thank you so much, Marvin and Preston. It's been uh, lovely to talk to you both. Thank you everyone for coming and I hope to see some of you again next week. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.